Hello! My adventure in podcasting continues now in 2024. This episode is a solo to introduce some themes and thoughts that I hope to explore moving forward. Stay with us. Welcome to Season 5 of Dialogues with Creators. In all honesty, I really thought about stopping. But I haven't. I love it. I think they're good. I haven't finished talking to people I want to talk to. The list of people to talk to is kind of endless. I want to bring some former guests back for the next chapter. So, the podcast moves on. But, one of the most important things in life happened to me on Epiphany, which, for those of you who don't know, is January 6th, also known as Three Kings Day in, um, in Hispanic culture. Our first grandchild was born. It is very hard not to sit with her and have fascinating conversations, although a little one-sided. Grandma, that's me, and Abuela, that's her mother's mother, are having fun although mom and dad are exhausted with an infant. She is starting to get used to the cold, cruel world, (laughs) and she's already been to Waffle House, and I guess that's to please the Appalachian-American side of her family. She's also been to the supermercado with Abuela, and she is, of course, beautiful. As soon as I finish this podcast, I'll be seeing her. She will also not have a social media presence for a long time. So the podcast every week thing is just not going to happen. More like bi-weekly or uh, twice a month for now. Each podcast takes three to four hours and there are plenty of other things happening in life, some of which I'm going to talk about here. I do want to announce that there is a GoFundMe for this podcast to pay the basic expenses. The link is in the show notes, as they say. Don't worry that the money will go to anything but upkeep and the production. I won't be buying a Lexus with the money. Speaking of GoFundMes, they do work. As some of you know, the communication department of Dalton State College is responsible for the world's greatest open educational resource on public speaking. In 2015, we got a grant from the University System of Georgia to create this book, and we thought it would only be used on our campus, and now it is used all over the world. We never expected that. I remember the first day, it was a Saturday, that I got a message and email from someone in Palestine and a university there that they were going to use the book. I, that was pretty cool. The book is free, digital, comprehensive, well-written, easy to understand, and popular. We get good reviews. Millions have probably downloaded it. At least one million. It also has been a life problem and has gone now through five editions to get to the state it's in. To fund the website where we communicate with the users, we needed money. GoFundMe came to the rescue, and now we have enough for five years of upkeep of the website. That's pretty cool. I wish that everyone who downloaded the book would also buy one of my novels, but such is life. Upcoming guests on the podcast include filmmakers Andrew Bullard and Emily Steele, I hope, uh, rising screenwriter Kenyon Henry, gallery owner David Aft, scholar Richard Herter, a revisit with humor educator Jerry Dry, a sculptor, a composer, and many others, and I hope a surprise. This season will be continuous for several months because I'm only going to do two a month and I won't need to take a break. For me, my big news is uh, professionally is that my ninth and, in my opinion, best novel will be published in early spring or Late Winter by Colorful Crow Publishing of Calhoun, Georgia. Lying In, which is the title for now, is historical fiction set in 1918 in deep Appalachia, which I would call it. Let me read the blurb since I worked on it a lot. The world is getting sick in a strange new way in October 1918, and Catella Barlow, known as Telly, treks through remote Appalachian Virginia to her next stop. Telly's job is to take care of the home and children while the mother recuperates from birth. It is a lonely life for Telly, who yearns for her own home and family, and it is made worse by her disfiguring disease that turns many people's eyes away from her. Now 31 and itinerant, 
She walks all day to her next family, the Goins, one of her longtime mamas and families. The Goins' three daughters and toddler son greet her with the news that Minnie, their mother, is very sick and can't get out of bed, even though it's not quite time for the baby. The world beyond their holler has shut down, and their father, a traveling laborer, may also have died from the encroaching Spanish flu epidemic. Soon Minnie is dead, and Telly is left to shepherd the children through the winter, in isolation as food dwindles and the world seems to have forgotten about them. In the end, her courage and love make their new life possible, even when she doesn't know which way to turn and an outside force threatens to destroy the children's futures together. And then here's the short blurb. When the world succumbs to a new sickness in October 1918, an outcast woman in remote Appalachia battles disease, deprivation, and isolation to protect four orphan children, which kind of gets to the point faster. Okay, some commentary for me on this. The book Grit by Angela Duckworth is famous for the claim, although I don't think she came up with it, that it takes 10,000 hours to gain expertise at something. As I've mentioned before, some so-called expert claim you can't really write until you've written a million words. Well, I've done both. But what's holding me and us back? A dear friend and writing partner gave me a mug yesterday with the words from successful novelist Karen Kingsbury. Your story is too beautiful not to tell. Wow. Also, after whining to another colleague and friend about feeling like I was writing for no purpose, I was reminded there is an audience out there. It's just a matter of finding it. Again, what's holding us back? For me, partially, it's the marketing. Sometimes I feel like it's synonymous with being obnoxious. Is that fair? Or is marketing synonymous with telling your story? I prefer the second. But why is it so hard to say, buy something I sweat and labored over for months, maybe years? Musicians have no trouble saying, I'm playing at this or that venue and my fees are blank blank. And artists have no trouble hanging a price tag on a painting or sculpture. What is it about writing? Or is it just me? Again, what's holding us, it's holding me back from going all the way I could with my writing? Well, I'm going to be honest, it's a lack of response. Now the guilt trip. I have two reviews of my latest novel on Amazon. That's pitiful. That's embarrassing. That's, I don't know what to call it. I've, been, I've had no sales of physical books on Amazon. And not very many Kindles. Somewhat understandable because it's better to get it from me personally, I suppose. I and other writers need your help. Support your local storytellers. I won't name names. You know who they are. If you go to a craft store and spend $40 on a friend's output, which I'm sure is lovely, why can't we spend 10 on a book or 15 I haven't figured that one out. So that's my challenge for you guys, not just for me, but for others. Support your local storytellers. Now, Speaking of uh, how many words it takes to become a writer, and I'm not sure I agree with the million word level, but we'll go on. I recently read a review of a new book by a writer who is supposedly well known, but I've never heard of her, uh, Jamie Attenberg. And the book is called 1000 Words. Let me read the prose around this book on Amazon. Again, a quotation. In 2018, novelist Jamie Attenberg, faced with a looming deadline, needed writing inspiration. Using a boot camp model, she and a friend set out to write 1,000 words daily for two weeks straight. They opened this practice to Attenberg's online community, and soon hundreds then thousands of people started using the 1,000 words of summer hashtag, track their work and support one another. What began as a simple challenge between two friends has become a literary movement. Write 1,000 words per day without judgment or bias or concern, uh, concerns about writer's block and see what comes of it. The book, A Thousand Words, is the book-length extension of this movement. It is about becoming and staying 
motivated, discovering yourself and your creative desires, and approaching your craft with a new direction. It features advice from more than 50 well-known writers, including New York Times bestsellers, Pulitzer Prize winners, and stars of the literary world. Framing these letters are words of wisdom and encouragement, plus specific strategies from Attenberg on how to carve out a creative plan for yourself all year round. Paired with vibrant word illustrations, A Thousand Words is an accessible and motivational craft book that allows you to open any page and get a quick and fulfilling hint of inspiration. End quote. And I believe this is from Amazon and her publicist. Okay. Then this uh, blurb goes into a list of, of the at least 50 contributors. And to be honest, I've only heard of two of them. And I only have the book of one, which I have yet to finish. <laughs> Does a writer ever have time to read books on writing? Other books in general? Well, no, we don't. But we have to. We cannot write without reading. And yet every minute we're reading sucks away from writing time. But so does sitting and holding my granddaughter and walking my dogs who need it desperately. And when it comes to my granddaughter, nothing gives me more joy. So what am I reading right now? Don't know if I'll get that book, A Thousand Words. I think I got the general idea. And many days I do write a thousand words. And just they don't see the light of, of a page that anybody would read. Um, for me, I'm reading, first of all, The Memory Police by Yoko Agawa. I recommend it. It sneaks up on you. Uh, and it's not a new book. It was published in 1994. It sneaks up on you because the prose style is so calm and Japanese. And yet it takes your breath away when you realize the, I always call it the undertext, as you might call it, what's really going on. I can't really explain what it's about, except it's, a, a dystopian situation where things just disappear and everyone gets used to it. And I'm just fascinated to see how this ends. I'm slowly reading Don Quixote, the very first novel ever written. I'm reading a young adult novel called The Day the Angel Fell by a fella named Sean Schmucker, <laughs> like the jellies. And it is very reminiscent of a Ray Bradbury type of um, story. Um, I've also been reading a book on lament by a pastor with the last name of Rogop. Very Dutch. <laughs> I think I might be going through a Dutch period here. Um, I'm reading The Secular Age by Charles Taylor, which is a fiction, uh, a nonfiction book, um, which is supposed to change one's view of everything. It hasn't yet for me, but it is profound. And I'm also coming towards the end of The Last Kingdom, getting to the end on that one. I loved the Netflix show, but there are some differences I haven't figured out. And I don't want to go back and watch the Netflix again. Well, all that sounds pretty pretentious. As for video, well, I would say check out uh, comedian Nate Bargatze on YouTube. He's very funny and he's clean. Somehow, even though he was clean, he managed to get on Saturday Night Live and he was quite funny. It's, he's very dry, though. Okay, so whether you have time to, you still need to read as a writer and, and as any type of uh, creator because the arts are interdisciplinary and they overlap. Two solo podcasts I will do later this semester are seeds of two books. The first is going to be called The Barbie Movie Explains It All and the other is on failure. Now, I loved The Barbie Movie. I watched it twice in two days, something I never do. And I was very moved by it. The scene where she realizes humanity, she's sitting in a park and she just sees people living and she starts to cry. It's a very subtle scene. And then she tells the old lady next to her, you're beautiful. Very touching, very moving. I'm allowed to say about it. Uh, my experience of it might be deeper than the actual film deserves. I don't know. And then I can't get away from America for our speech and where she says at the end, all the stress she goes under and she says, and somehow it's always my fault. I think all of us have felt that way. Women get blamed for a lot 
because from the dawn of time, man blamed women. And if you read Genesis 3, you know what I'm talking about. Even if you're listening to this and you think that's a myth, it's really remarkable that Adam's response to his own disobedience was to blame his wife and to blame God. (laughs) So I just thought that was incredibly telling. Now, my other book on failure. In terms of failure, failure stinks. All my life I've been told failure is a stepping stone to success. That's whatever. I don't think failure is a great teacher. Failure is going to happen and we can learn from it. But I don't see us idolizing it as automatically teaching us the way to success. Failure teaches you that you failed. It doesn't teach you what the path to success is. It just tells you what the path to failure is. Failure is costly and painful. People die because of failure. We all remember the Challenger explosion in 1986, or at least most of us do. That failure has been dissected, and even movies have been made about how it went wrong. Failure is also inevitable. I have, I have some hard-earned things to say about failure because I failed more than I succeeded. I especially fail when it comes to my political views. Uh, As you probably know, I'm no fan of Donald Trump, and I really believe we would get a different Republican candidate. It doesn't look that way. I like Nikki. I like DeSantis. He strikes me as the smartest and most competent person in the room, although he is criticized for not being charming and for getting into some unnecessary cultural wars, unnecessary in some opinions at least. Charm, well, it only takes you so far. I don't live in Florida and under the Disney regime. Overall, I like Nikki better, but she seems to have lost something. The thought that Trump might win again doesn't scare me to death like some people, but it sure makes me want to put my head in the sand. As I've said before, it's time for two elderly men to retire and leave the American electorate alone rather than hold on to their egos. Trump is very entertaining. I think the word outrageous is the most appropriate word for him. But he just needs to get a TV show and leave the rest of us alone, those who don't want to look at him or see him. And I think both of them have aging problems. And I say this as a person who's aging myself. That's my first podcast and uh, of the season. And I kept it short. <laughs> no, no reason for me to go on and on. This is not about my professional life. It's about my artistic life. What I hope to do in a later uh, broadcast is revisit uh, maybe some research on creativity and what it is and what holds it together and how all creative people are doing the same kinds of things. Uh, I think creativity is like having a sense of humor. It's a, it's a way of approaching the world. It's a way of seeing things that maybe other people don't see or that just all of a sudden you see in a new way. I do hope that you will continue to listen. I hope that you will find this uh, useful and that you will also you know, tell other people to listen so we can get uh, maybe more, some more listeners. Thank you very much. Have a great day. <laughs>